Hello everybody, a few words before we start with the podcast. Now this time we were lucky enough to be able to record our interviews in our very own ZSL library. Now while clearly a place of learning, there's also some activity around, so you will hear the odd bit of background noise. Whoever said libraries were quiet places, clearly not me, after all I was recording an interview in one. Anyway, my apologies for any background noise, personally I think it adds to the atmosphere. And thanks again to our amazing library team for letting us make noise in our wonderful library. Now let's get on with the podcast. Hello and welcome to the Cenozoal Wild Science Podcast. I'm Moni Boom and I'm a research fellow at the Zoological Society of London's Institute of Zoology, which generally means that most of the time I spend at a desk crunching numbers and analyzing data, but on occasion I'm actually let out to investigate some of the current hot topics in conservation. But don't worry when I'm let out, this is always under strict supervision and this week this job falls to our very own Jess Jones. Hi Jess. Hello. So Jess is a trainee keeper at ZSL London Zoo. At London Zoo our keepers are using the latest findings on animal behaviour to positively impact the welfare of our animals. And this also means that Jess is highly qualified to keep me under control for the next half hour or so. Definitely. Good, excellent. <laughs> I've got some good training skills. <laughs> I'll be giving you my paw by the end of this. Um, more importantly than keeping me under control, we will learn about the daily work of our keepers to provide our animals with the best care, such as giving them ample opportunities to express their natural behaviours. And also how our keepers are working hard to give our animals choice and control over their environment. Most importantly, I was promised to get the answer to a question I've been pondering a lot over recent years. Is it possible to train a fish? It certainly is. I'll tell you later. <laughs> Excellent. First of all, Jess, thanks for looking after me today. So which animals are you uh, working with day to day? So I'm really lucky that I get to work on the animal activity section here at the zoo. So we're a little bit of a mix mash of loads of different animals really and we all work really closely with lots of the members of the public. So we have uh, lots of exotic mammals. So we have animals such as coatis, porcupines, meerkats, mongoose. We then also have the domestic animals, so things like pigs, llamas, donkeys, and goats. Everyone loves a goat. And then we've got lots of birds of prey, um, as well as so lots of owl species as well. And then we have loads of parrots as well. So we've got green wings, we've got military macaws, and we do lots of presentations at the zoo and demonstrations and talks to the public where we'll actually bring the animals out for display for everyone to have a look at all their natural behaviours that they'll do out in the wild. I'm sure you get asked this all the time, but what, in a nutshell, is kind of the day-to-day -day of a zookeeper or a trainee zookeeper in yeah. this sense? Well, we actually, we always start work at 8 o'clock in the morning and we always have a meeting uh, in the morning, which is where we have diaries and we write down what happens the day before. So anything behavioural that might have happened with the animal or any medical things that might have happened, any training that we've done. So we can all sit together and catch up all the keepers that had the previous day off. And then in the morning, it's breakfast. So feeding time at the zoo, you've got to make sure that everyone's got all of their breakfast. If you're late, the animals will definitely tell you. So you need to make sure that you're there on time. After that, it's a lot of cleaning. So being a keeper is picking up poo and we enjoy picking it up. <laughs> so we don't mind, it's part of our job. We just go around making sure that all the animals are nice and healthy, had their breakfast, their enclosures are nice and clean. Then in the afternoon, for us, we do a lot of the demonstrations. That's where a lot of training will happen as well and a lot of enrichment that we provide for our animals. Uh, so the afternoons are sort of a bit more, make sure your animals are really doing well in their captive environments, giving them lots of things to do. <laughs> While Jess is talking to me, I'm actually filling in my application for the job, to be quite honest, because it just sounds lovely. It is, best job in the world. It's primarily the poo cleaning yeah, of that, course. that did yeah, it yeah. for me, of course. <laughs> So I was told that training is a major part in enhancing animal welfare. 100% yes. We use all of these training to basically use behavioural management so we can use it for their husbandry and their welfare. So for example, if we know an animal has a veterinary procedure coming up and they might need to have a general anaesthetic, we can actually then train them to have that injection administrated by us or the vets. And that means then that we don't have to dart our animals. They know exactly what's coming. They know exactly what's going to happen. They're aware of their situations. And then we can also give them the coping skills to be able to deal with that. Rather than if you imagine getting shot in the bum by a dart, it really hurts. You don't know what's going on. Then you start to get a little bit tired, a little bit sleepy. It's much nicer if we can just train them and 
so we accept having this injection done and then it means actually that the sedatives work a lot quicker because they're not stressed because they have these coping mechanisms as well. And so with the presentations that you're working on as well, I suppose training is also a massive component there. Yeah, so we'll use um, different training skills uh, and different training methods depending on the species but also on the individual. So you might have one kawati that one training method might work for them but it might not work for the other individual so it's tweaking the training methods as well to suit those animals as well and we always use uh, positive reinforcement training here at the zoo there are other training methods that we use but the main one is positive reinforcement where we always ignore the negative behavior and reward positive behavior i personally think that people have also used that on on me to yeah. be quite honest every time you do something like like have a chocolate <laughs> it works a treat it really yeah. does Right, so Jess told me that there's definitely one person who can tell us more about anything to do with animal welfare here at ZSL, and that's Jim Mackey. Now, Jim is our... Well, I'm the Animal Training and Behaviour Officer. And I was also told that you know all about this thing that we call BMC, which I think stands for Behavioural Management Committee, is that correct? Yes. So what is the BMC, and how did it all come about? Well, it was founded by zookeepers and it was just like-minded keepers who wanted to share their experiences and knowledge in a specific field, which was behaviour management. Now, behaviour management incorporates things like animal training for um, enhanced welfare, um, behavioural enrichment, and also things like enclosure modification and sometimes even things like nutrition. So we kind of incorporate all those things into the behaviour management committee and it's essentially, and it always was, just representatives from every animal section. So people that look after fish or bugs or mammals, didn't matter, we all came together and we started to share our experiences and knowledge of this subject. And that's where it came from. Awesome, so Jess has told me about the enrichment building evenings. She mentioned there's pizza involved as well, which I found very interesting. But what do you do at these evenings? Well, the pizza is really important, by the way, because that's what we call our positive reinforcement. Um, at the end of the end of the hard work, everyone needs a reward, right? Absolutely, so that's it works the, with me as well. By oh, the way, indeed, yeah. that's where the pizza comes in. Uh, yeah, but you know, these these evenings, are, I find them really inspiring because it certainly wasn't anything to do with me. It was all to do with the keepers again getting together and saying one of the things that we really want to do is to um, it's like team building. You know, we have people from all over the zoo, not always zookeepers as well. We have presenters and and, and anyone can come and help us. Um, and build specific enrichment devices for certain animals and uh, and then the best part of it is that the, the next day when it gets light we then offer the enrichment to the animals and we can see the result and normally it's some cool natural behavior that has been part of the planning process about the these enrichment nights so for example the most recent one was all about giant anteaters we wanted to encourage the natural behavior of foraging for bugs and we we certainly achieved that and we've got some cool videos to that, that prove that as well Excellent. So when you talk about enrichment for the animals, what specifically are you talking about? Well, enrichment is, is really simple. It's, it's basically adding anything to the animal's environment that can encourage natural behaviour. So it's promoting natural behaviour. The real purpose of it is it's supposed to, in some way, enhance physical and psychological well-being. I suppose we also have to keep in mind that ZSL is a conservation organisation. So how can we use behavioural management in our zoos to actually benefit conservation. I hear you might have some stories to tell about lions. Yeah, we've done some specific projects um, using enrichment and training to enhance capacity of Asiatic lions in, in a zoo in India. But um, we've also done stuff in, in the zoo as well. So we've trained animals to accept radio tracking collars that have then been used in the field. So with uh, hunting dogs and also with pygmy sloths. So we've been really active in that because we, we understand and appreciate that one of ZSL's goals is to be a conservation pioneer. And so we feel we can really help that with our behavior management. So what's the kind of work that you've done in India? So um, we've, we did some workshops, so it was a collaborative effort between uh, the Zoological Society of London and lots of different parts of the ZSL, so conservation programs, education, wildlife health and the animal teams. And we all worked on, on this project and it was a memorandum of understanding between us, the Gujarat Forest Department and the Wildlife Institute of India. 
and our part was all about teaming up with the zoo that houses the headquarters of the Asiatic lion population. So there's like 60 odd Asiatic lions over in the Sackerberg Zoo in Gujarat. And so we went there and we did a week long workshop which enabled the animals there to have some amazing enrichment. You know, having spoken to both the representatives from the Gujarat Forest Department and the WII, the Wildlife Institute of India, that it had a significant impact on the way that these animals are managed in situ. Some of them may end up back out into the wild. Oh, fantastic. Jim, I don't think I can let you go without asking, what's the most unusual animal you've trained? I don't know about unusual. I suppose the, the hardest one was probably a, a group of fruit bats. And that was pretty tricky. But, um, you know, I, I think the one that had the, the most effect on me was probably training the zebras because it was something that I'd always looked at these amazing animals and thought, this is such a peculiar creature. It looks like something out of a cartoon, you know. When you look at them close up, you, ne you never get yeah, it bored of it. It looks like somebody painted on it. Yeah, it's just nuts, you know. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so teaming up with some colleagues who work in the ungulate department now, uh, that, was, uh, that was an amazing, amazing project to work on. I still think back fondly of the, the days when I was training the zebras here at London Zoo. And what were you training them for? Well, it was, uh, it was all welfare-based. The, the main uh, purpose of it was actually to um, create some kind of bond of trust between the keepers and the animal, which was not present before. Also, we had this idea that we might be able to replace our vaccination. So we do preventative health with a lot of the animals at the zoo, and part of that process is vaccination. And to achieve vaccination, you sometimes have to uh, dart them. And so we were like, we don't want to dart them anymore. We're going to see whether we can train them to accept a hand injection. That's what we were able to achieve. With three of the four, Spot the zebra still hasn't been hand injected yet, but he's, uh, he's a work in progress. There's a zebra in the zoo called Spot. Yeah, he's the that's only zebra awesome. I know that's got a spot. Yeah, and come and see him. <laughs> Excellent, I really, really should. And um, I've got one last question for you, actually, Jim. I hear our um, Asiatic lions here at ZSL had a run-in with a queen at some point, right? Yeah, so um, that's right. We had a big royal event just a couple of years ago now, wasn't it? When we opened our biggest flagship exhibit in years, uh, Land of the Lions. So yeah, um, we, uh, we were able to um, use some really cool behaviour management techniques in order to ask the animals to voluntarily participate in a nice photo shoot that included the Queen. Yeah, there's, um, there's some pretty good evidence out there online if you want to just uh, put in the Queen plus Lions at London Zoo. Hundreds of pictures. Excellent, fantastic. I will actually do that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jim. You're welcome. So, Jess, what's your favourite animal at the zoo? And do you have any cool training or enrichment stories about it? One of my favourite animals at the zoo is uh, we have our goats. And I know that's not everyone expected, because whenever you think of zoos, you always think of having lions, tigers, gorillas, elephants, all these amazing flagship species. But actually, the domestic animals are just as important as any other animal in the zoo, and they all deserve to be trained and have enrichment. So uh, one of the training things that we have done with our goats, which is a really good way of giving them choice and control, is we've trained them to go for walks around the zoo, but without a harness on. They have a bucket with a bicycle adorable. bell on top, and then we ring the bell and then they come over to us, and that means that we can walk them around the zoo, uh, and whenever we ring the bell, they come back to us and we give them a little bit of their food and then we can go on to our next stop, wherever we want to go. We go see some other animals around the zoo. But because they don't have a harness on, if they don't want to leave their enclosure, they don't have to. If it starts raining when they're out and they don't like the rain and they want to come back, they can literally just turn back and the walk and everything is entirely up to them really and they can do whatever they want with it. So yeah, it's a really good way of giving them choice and control. Cool. So our next guest knows a thing or two about animal welfare, because Lisa Clifford is actually our animal welfare officer here at ZSL. What does an animal welfare officer do? Well, it's one of those ones that's a little bit difficult to explain, actually. But my duties consist of assessing the animal welfare of the animals in our collections, so figuring out what we're doing well, what, what there's room for improvement for 
where we do recognise that there are spaces where we should improve things. I then work with the keepers and other teams to come up with these solutions, to put them into practice and to monitor them to see if they're actually working the way that we hope they will. And then the other part is working with our events teams and kind of the commercial part of ZSL and making sure that other activities that we're doing don't cause new problems for animals. So that could be things like building a new exhibit or it could be an evening function that's going on or a talk that's happening. So we work to kind of put preventative strategies in place as well. Okay, so it's actually quite a varied job. Absolutely. I never know what I'm going to be doing from one day to the next. I mean, there's quite a lot of desk work, it has to be said. There's a lot of meetings and talking with people and transferring information and finding out what one person's doing, what the next person wants to do. So, yeah, very, very varied from day to day. So you mentioned the monitoring that we do to ensure that the stuff that we put in for our animals' welfare is actually also working. What does that monitoring involve? So when we make changes and improvements, we try to be quite target-based about them. So we know what we want to achieve. And what we can do is observe our animals before the change takes place. So perhaps we'd be looking at, we want to give our animals uh, an increased repertoire of feeding behaviours. So we would get a baseline behaviour on that and find out how much time our animals are spending feeding and what different behaviours they display while they're feeding. Then we'd put our changes in place and then we'd repeat our observations again and compare the data that we get to see if we've actually had the differences that we want, which would be the increase in time spent and the variety of behaviours. So there's a lot of behind the scenes research really going on that visitors might come to the zoo, but they will actually not even realise how much work there's going into monitoring our animals on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, absolutely. We're constantly doing kind of little applied bits of observational work on the ground like that. That's, it's never a big enough project to publicise or publish because it's very small and unique to, to an individual animal, but we're constantly doing it. One of the things I was actually going to ask you, what does welfare actually mean? Oh, good question. <laughs> so there can be quite often there can be a confusion between animal welfare and animal rights. So animal welfare is concerned with the quality of life that the individual has. So that could be physical factors like its environment and its health and its diet. Um, but it also looks at the mental factors as well. So does the animal feel like it's having a positive life experience? Um, is it behaving normally? That kind of stuff. Animal rights is more concerned with theoretical things such as, is it okay to keep an animal in captivity? Is it okay to decide whether an animal lives or dies? So the two are very separate and my role's very specifically focused on the welfare side of things. And so how do you go about assessing animal welfare? There are a lot of different techniques that we can use. So sometimes people will use physiological measures. So perhaps we would look at things like stress hormones or respiratory rates or growth rates or mortality rates, something very measurable like that. Um, but a lot of what I'm involved in is the behavioural observations. So we're very much looking for comparisons between the before and the after, or perhaps between individual A and individual B to tell us what's going on. And so in these welfare assessments, what species are usually included in that or does it just go across all the different taxa that we have here at ZSL? So I strongly feel that we need to apply welfare equally to all taxa so we have analysed everything from ants to elephants already. Excellent, how do you assess the welfare of an ant? Exactly the same way we do it with an elephant to be honest. So we set ourselves objectives, what do we need our ants to be able to do and how should they be behaving and what do they need access to and then we measure and see if we've actually met those goals. So what is it that we would for example want an ant to do? So we would look at things like how much of their day can they spend foraging, what kind of distances can they cover, what's their response like to things that they might perceive as a threat. So for instance, um, it could be shadows moving over the exhibit or visitors approaching closely or keepers moving into the exhibit, that kind of thing. We look at the health of the colony, so obviously you'd expect some individuals to die over the course of a year in a, in a colony that has thousands if not millions of animals, but we want to make sure that that's within normal expected levels. We would look at the health of the, the individuals. So do we have the right proportions of workers to soldiers? Do they, are they all robust and healthy looking? They've not got infections or missing limbs or anything like that. So there's loads of different factors we can consider. This is absolutely fascinating. How do you get into this field? What got you to become an animal welfare officer? Well, for me, I did psychology at A-level, which involved looking at animal behaviour. And then I picked a degree, which was animal behaviour and welfare. I then I wanted to work in zoo animal welfare but didn't really realise there was the opportunity at that time so I went the keeping route um, and worked my way up from keeper to curator slash animal manager and then it was while I was kind of looking for my next step that the job role came up for animal welfare officer at ZSL and I was able to go back to doing exactly what I'd originally wanted to do. Well that's awesome. Okay so we just talked about um, how 
it is possible to train really, really tiny things. So I feel that we have to kind of move back to some of the bigger species again that we have here at the zoo. With me now is Jacob Winfield, who I was told is our very own crazy inventor. I have no idea what that means. Jacob, explain yourself. I think you're trying to call me that because I've uh, recently started making a load of puzzle feeders for our gorillas and not just making the same one over again, just trying to make some different things. So we've come up with some crazy ideas of making slides down the side, so little shortcuts for nuts and uh, zigzag ones, so it's quite fun. So you're actually inventing puzzles for primates? Yep, at the moment we're just uh, just doing it with our gorilla troop, but once we've hit, I think we're going to try and make eight of them. We're going to start working on some for the smaller primates as well, so we've got our sort of easy crested macaques and the mangabees as well. We're going to try and make some for those. I am literally completely <laughs> gobsmacked right now. Um, I've already previously spoken to Jess and started filling in my application to become zookeeper. Yeah. Um, now I really want to become crazy inventor of puzzles for primates as yeah. well, to be quite honest. So what's the <laughs> weirdest thing you've come up with? At the moment it's probably the zigzag puzzle feeder where they've got to knock it over little bumps but I say that and they'll probably find it really easy so it's, a, it's different every time you put something in you're not quite sure what reaction you're going to get. The hardest ones are sometimes the easier ones for them. So, so has it actually happened where you thought oh I've come up with a really really cool thing that will actually keep them entertained for a yeah. while and they just looked at you going like Pfft, Yeah easy. it takes them about two seconds to learn to see it sometimes. <laughs> We actually went to Whipsnade at some point and there was this feeder, I think, for one of the chimps. There was a, yep. There's a puzzle there on, on display and we all tried it. And I mean, we were ridiculously rubbish at it, to be quite <laughs> honest. And then read the explanation that it took her about, I don't know, however long it was, like 30 seconds max, something like this. Yep. I'm not particularly good at them. Not as good as the gorillas are. And so what other type of enrichment do you provide for our gorillas here? At for the gorillas we give them a lot of substrates, so we give them different substrates, so bed mats and hay to forage around and play in. Uh, we give them novel objects, so um, boom balls and stuff like that to play with. Cool, awesome. What's the weirdest gorilla story in terms of when you provided Ooh. enrichment? Probably when we I recently gave the infants a bale of uh, new hay that we were trying out. It's um, held together a bit better. And I came in and could only count five gorillas for a while and then realised that one of our infant gorillas, Gurn, the smallest one, had actually buried himself in the hay and was waiting for the other gorillas to walk past so he could jump out and surprise them. <laughs> so very, 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 very much like a human child would do. Yeah, well. playing along, yeah, playing with his siblings and his uh, parents. Uh, Excellent, that's great. Thanks very much, right. Jacob. And moving on to even bigger things, now we're definitely back with our very big fauna here at ZSL. So with me now is Matt O'Leary and he probably has one of the coolest jobs, I have to say, because he is senior elephant keeper. Hello. How do you keep your elephants happy? <laughs> the, the main thing about keeping elephants happy is to know what makes elephants happy. Um, so that, that requires a bit of research and it also requires a bit of watching our elephants to see what they're up to and, and seeing what makes them happy. We, we have eight elephants at Whipsnade and each of them have different personalities and some do stuff that some of the others don't do and some enjoy stuff that the others don't do. So for example, we've got a young, young boy elephant called Sam who's four years old and he just likes to... Um, to hit things and beat things up and, and, and that's, that's because he's, he's a young male and he wants to do that. We've got another elephant called Donna who likes to dig. We've got a older elephant, Kaylee, who just loves to get covered in, in mud and they, they're very varied personalities and so it's important that we watch what they're doing and know what our elephants want essentially. So how much of your time is actually spent watching your elephants and trying to figure out what the next thing is that you could provide for them? This is a huge part of our job. I mean, it goes in hand in hand with cleaning up then there's obviously a lot of that to do but we're quite lucky that we have a 24-hour surveillance system in our barn so we're able to watch them and, and be able to run through footage very quickly to look overnight and see what elephants will be doing overnight um, so yeah it's all of us will be doing that each elephant keeper will be spending time watching elephants either directly in the paddocks or running through CCTV so yeah it's, it's as much a part of our day as cleaning up or doing training etc. So you refer to it as a barn, so I was recently up in Whipsnay and it's actually our very new centre for... Centre for Elephant Care, you're right. <laughs> so it's actually a quite high-tech barn, really. Yeah, it has lots of 
modern stuff that's, that's very beneficial to keeping elephants. So the substrate is sand, which has multiple different benefits. Um, so it gives the elephants a nice pillow to lie on, gives them the ability to dust bathe. Like I said, we can bury stuff, we can change the landscape. We've got some really cool machinery that we can go in there and change. So that's really beneficial. We have timed feeders, um, so it, we can hang hay nets up and they come down at certain times and so it gives the animals opportunity to be grazing all night which is very relevant to the species and then we have some upright trees etc that we're able to hang different stuff off browse etc so that's really promoting the natural behavior of elephants browsing from a height so yeah there's some really useful stuff in there that will hopefully make our elephants much happier so a bit more than just your conventional barn absolutely yes <laughs> it is a very upgraded barn yeah. <laughs> <laughs> excellent and um, what about when our elephants need a veterinary checkup is there some behavioral training in that respect as well that you do Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So we train our animals um, and we train them purely for husbandry reasons. So if we have any concerns and our animals are recall trained so they can come over, but also we're, we're able to, or at least we're aiming to be able to get blood, etc. voluntarily. Um, we're able to wash our elephants regularly, we're able to do foot care regularly. So training is part of our morning routine. Um, and we have different goals for for each elephant. So yeah, any any regular healthcare stuff, we're able to do that with with the animals volunteering and very stress free. So, because I'm obsessed about being an elephant keeper so much that I started dreaming about it at night. It was very odd, but also very awesome. I mean, cool dreams, right? Mm -hmm. um, what's the best thing about being an elephant keeper? The best thing about being an elephant, for me anyway, is is the challenge to to really identify what the animal needs what each individual needs and then trying to trying to do that and when you see when you plan something and you put it in there and you see that animal doing the behavior that you, you wanted that's a really rewarding feeling for me I, i get a lot from just seeing an elephant using its trunk like having its trunk up in the air browsing naturally i, I get a lot from that and that's really why I'm, i'm working with them to try and promote that natural behavior the last thing i've got to ask you about You know that barn that you were talking about that was opened by, I believe, Her Majesty the Queen? Correct. There must have been some training there as well, because if I remember correctly, one of our elephants was actually fed bananas. Yes, absolutely, on by, the day. by the Majesty the Queen herself, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the elephants are, are very used to having people around them, and obviously, banana is quite a high value item to them. So, it, it didn't take a huge amount of coercion for the elephant to get a banana off the Queen, but yeah, they, they're very happy to, to take bananas and they will do that all day if they need to. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, no matter who presents, she was very happy. Them. Yeah, if it was the Queen or anyone, she was very happy to take a banana. Anything <laughs> for a banana, yeah. excellent. I can totally identify with this. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. So our next guest is Luke Harvey. And Luke also has a really awesome job because um, Luke actually is the deputy team leader for Predators. <laughs> you make That's, it sound very exciting. <laughs> it does sound very exciting. Remember that we are all not zookeepers. We It's find great. all the stuff that you do incredibly exciting. So what does that mean? What does that mean? So on our team, we have a nice mix of species. So... Uh, my favourite, the African wild dog, and then we have Sumatran tigers, Asiatic lions, uh, giant anteaters, Asian short-clawed otters, some meerkats, and some dwarf mongoose. So we've got quite a nice variety of animals on the on the section. You're obviously well into your African wild dogs. Mm -hmm. Cool. So about the project mm -hmm. with the radio collars, mm -hmm. what did that involve? So we trained our dogs to accept new technology tracking collars, so that we could help researchers develop new ways to study wild dogs in the wild. Um, we collaborated with the Institute of Zoology here at London Zoo. Uh, Rosie Woodruff is the um, lead researcher on the wild dogs and she's involved in the range-wide conservation project as well. And she got contacted by the Swansea University uh, who had developed this new bit of technology called a Fitbit. And it works mm -hmm. like a daily diary, sort of similar technology you might have in your phone. Basically it's a data logger which with the research done in zoos were able to see what certain data points correlate to certain behaviours, so such as running, digging, lying down, even feeding. So basically the, the project was to try and fit these to two of our, or four of our dogs, two through training and two were fitted under anaesthetic for a, when they were relocated to Whipsnay Zoo. And then basically the, the researcher was compiling all the data from watching it live and also CCTV. So the collar stayed on for four weeks 
and they've got you know, millions and millions and millions of data sets which I don't mm. quite understand but they are yeah, able to then see basically give a much bigger picture of how dogs are living their daily lives. Yeah. And so I suppose from the data that they got they could essentially then say matching it up with the observations, yes. what behaviour it was, yes. and so if they deploy them in the wild, they can then yes. interpret That's the data exactly that, that they get back. That's exactly how it is. So yeah, they needed to do it in a captive um, environment, zoological environment, so that, you know, otherwise, like I say, if you just put it on the dog and you couldn't see what they're doing, all these little dots and dashes Don't would mean, mean nothing. Don't mean anything, yeah. yes, they're so just dots. So it's a really dots. important part of, of the research. And then, um, although it hasn't been used in wild dogs yet, since the researcher got her results, they have actually taken it out and used it on other canids because of similar body movements and body dynamicism. So it has already been used in wild animal research, which is really you know, really cool to be a part of actually something that's physically going out and helping with uh, in situ field research. It's been great. So proud of our dogs and yeah, proud of dogs the team are the doing pioneers. It. Yeah, Come exactly. On. It's, um, Dogs wearing Fitbits, I mean, exactly, yeah. it's totally what you want. Well, that's great, thank you very much. That's all right. So, Jess, the question I've been meaning to ask all along, you know what's coming, right? Yeah. <laughs> is it possible to train a fish? It is possible to train any animal to do pretty much anything. So, here at the zoo, normally... People, what they'll do is they'll just use a net just to scoop the fish up. It doesn't have a choice in this and it'll just be put into another tank. But what we decided and the, uh, the BMC decided was actually how can we do this and improve this animal's life and give it choice and control over what it wants to do. So what we did was we trained it to actually go into a jug and then it would get rewarded when it went into the jug and then we would just lift the jug up ever so slightly and then move it into our next enclosure. And every single time, even if we didn't move the fish out of its enclosure, we just wanted to do the training session, they'd always go in for a little bit of a reward. So it's a better way of doing it for the animals really. Again, they know exactly what's coming, they know what to expect of them, nothing bad's gonna happen to them and they get food so they're quite happy to do the behavior again and again. So you said that any animal can be trained. What yeah. about a snail? Yeah, you could. You, what you could do with them is you could probably have a target, and then you could put the target down and put. Then the snail would know if I go onto this target, I get a piece of lettuce or a piece of cucumber, whatever the snail might like to eat. And then you could, I guess, if the target had a stick on the end, you could then pick the snail up rather than physically picking it up and restraining it with your own hands. You could give it the choice to go onto the target and then move it into a different enclosure. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I have this well. funny feeling that I might start trying that in my <laughs> spare time. <laughs> Jess, we've clearly learned a lot today. Mm -hmm. uh, first and foremost, that our keepers here at Zedeza really do work hard and go above and beyond to ensure that our animals are well, happy and healthy. Definitely. That's what we love doing. So we go on a lot of enrichment making workshops. So we'll learn how to use fire hose and how to make that into really fun uh, enrichment devices. Probably my favourite one was we had a paper mache party. After work, all of the keepers on our section, we brought in balloons and flour and newspaper from the metro, which we get on the tube, and we just sit there and we have biscuits and put a bit of music on and just make paper mache for all the animals. Because they love it, it's a really, really fun way to encourage their natural foraging. And because it's just flour and water and newspaper, it's not harmful for them and you can hang it up in so many different places and you can put food in it for them and they love shredding it to pieces, especially so parrots. It's, so it's a little bit like a piñata, really? Basically, yeah. yeah. Not only have, have we learned that our keepers are super versatile, but we've also learned how they really monitor what's happening to the animals. Definitely, yeah. How we take animals on goat walks. Yes. I haven't forgotten. And how we provide so much different enrichment activities but also training so that they can really deal with the day-to-day -day of mm -hmm. being a zoo animal. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I mean, us being a keeper, we're solely there for the animals to make sure that they're okay and the more that we can do for them, the better, really. Cool, excellent. So thanks very much, You're much Jess, and I'll see you on our little goat walk. Definitely, look forward to it. See you then. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.